This evening, I'd like to begin by reading Philippians 2, uh, verses 1 through 16. Again, a very familiar passage, and, you know, I, I think it's, it's helpful to be reminded of what are called the classic passages, you know, those that are the, the clearest, um, and certainly as we continue to put, as it were, arrows in our arsenal to seek to prove the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ, this gives us a few more of those arguments that we need, but also tells us of what he was willing to do in order to save us. And again, we're talking about a real person, talking about one who is truly God, who created all things, as we've seen, who is willing to actually become one of his creatures in order to save us. And the fact that he would do that is perhaps the greatest mystery, why he would love us so much that he would be willing to do this. And again, as we come to the table, we need to see the culmination of what it is that Jesus Christ did. He became a man that he might obey, but he also became a man that he might die, that he might die on the cross, make a payment for our sins so that we might be saved. Let's read about that in Philippians 2, verses 1 through 16. Paul writes, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory, because I did not run in vain, nor toil in vain. May the Lord bless his word to our understanding again this evening. Now, I just want to remind you again this morning, we were considering that the Word became flesh. The Son of God became a man, as we saw. He pitched his tent among men in order that he might reveal his Father, that he might explain him to us uh, in, in a living example. Remember, he is the image of God who became a man to exegete or to explain his Father, to show us what he was like or what he is like, and to show us what it is he wants us to do by way of living example. We also saw that he became flesh that he might bring about, as it were, grace and truth. He is the one who shows us what the old covenant was pointing to, what the moral law was pointing to, the civil law, the ceremonial laws, and he did that by fulfilling them. And in fulfilling them, we also saw that he provided grace that there might be a gospel. Now, Jesus is the one through whom the Father reveals his truth and gives grace. As we saw this morning in Jesus, there is fullness of grace. 
There is grace heaped upon grace, grace instead of grace. And he will give that grace to you, which amounts, of course, to mercy, to forgiveness, a title to heaven, if you will only trust him. Now, tonight I thought it would be helpful for us to look a little bit more carefully at the incarnation. That's one thing we looked at this morning, but we didn't really have time to deal or to delve into it too deeply. That God became a man. You know, we uh, talk about the incarnation. It means basically to uh, take flesh upon yourself. I want us to see this evening what that means. What it means for our Lord Jesus Christ and what it doesn't mean. Uh, so that we can see what it is that Jesus, again, was willing to do for us. And at the same time, avoid any misunderstanding that we may possibly have that would dishonor God. And there are some ideas circulating out there that really do dishonor Him. Now, I want us to look at three things. I want us to see what the incarnation is. I want us to see that after the incarnation, Jesus has two natures, that He is fully God and fully man, and what that means. And then I want us to see what the Father was willing to do for the Lord Jesus Christ because He was willing to humble himself to such a degree. I want us to take a look briefly at his exaltation and then just make a few applications as far as what difference all this should make uh, to us. So first of all, what is the incarnation? Well, again, it's what John was telling us about this morning, that the one who is eternally God, the one who is the eternal Son of God, the one who is the only begotten God in the bosom of the Father, that he became a man. Now Paul actually reminds us of this in our text this evening in verses five and six, that Jesus is in fact God. And again, here is a few more things we can put into our arsenal to prove in case we run into a Jehovah's Witness. And actually, we don't have to go looking for them because they come looking for us. So when they come to your door, you'll have something to talk to them about. And remember, you know, don't see them as, as adversaries, though they, they are in a certain sense adversaries, but see them as souls that need to hear the truth in order to be saved. I should mention that uh, Peter Barnes, who um, I'm not sure if he's still living or not, but um, several years ago when we were in Calvary Chapel that he was um, ministering in those circles and other circles as well, ministering, uh, helping the saints minister to Jehovah's Witnesses, he was a Jehovah's Witness for most of his life. He was the head over several kingdom halls. He said that in all the years and all the thousands of doors he knocked on, he said he could count probably on two hands how many people actually talked to him about Jesus Christ. But there were a few who did, and the Lord used that to convert him. So your witness does make a difference. The Lord will call to himself even those out of these cults. But this is what Paul says in verses 5 and 6. He says, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now, notice two things. that Jesus existed in the form of God, which doesn't mean that, that he was like God, but that he shared his nature. This is what Paul means by this word form. He's of the same nature as God. And notice, secondly, that Paul says he was equal with God. He did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now, really, you can't let go of something unless you first have it. The Son of God... The only begotten God, Jesus was and is equal with the Father. And you can't be equal with God unless you are God. Now again, we've spent a lot of time on that. I just wanted to draw your attention to those two things. But I do want you to notice that this one who was in the form of God and who was equal with God did something remarkable. He became a man. Paul writes in verses 7 and 8. He emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. 
Now notice Paul says that he emptied himself. He took the form of a bondservant, was made in the likeness of men, and he humbled himself to death or to die. Now basically we want to ask ourselves the question, what does this mean? What is the incarnation? What happened? What did Jesus actually empty himself of? Well, the first thing we need to make sure we, we don't mistake this as saying is that Jesus did not empty himself of his divinity. He didn't strip himself, as it were, of his Godhead. He didn't cease being God in order to become a man. Now, some teach that Jesus did do this, that he stripped himself of deity and replaced it with humanity, put off his one nature and took on another nature so that he was no longer God except being a divine person but that he was merely a man and of course once his work was done he laid aside his humanity and took his deity back and now he is only God. Now we do need to avoid that error because that we would say is heretical, something we should not believe, something that is demeaning to God. Now how do we know that that could not happen? Well we know that because the Bible tells us God cannot change. And if one who is God becomes a man and ceases to be God, I would say I, that would qualify as a change. I'd say a rather radical one. Uh, the psalmist tells us in Psalm 55 verse 19, God will hear and answer them, even the one who sits enthroned from of old with whom there is no change. Malachi 3.6, for I the Lord do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. And then James writes in James 1.17, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. See, one of the foundational doctrines of Christianity is that it is impossible for God to change. As a matter of fact, uh, that debate probably still is, is raging in certain quarters. But if God were changeable in any way, then we could never really be certain of anything that he has promised us because he might change. See, he might change his mind. He might decide to do something other than what he has determined from all eternity. One of the uh, bedrock foundations of Christianity is that God cannot change. And if God is perfect and he were to change, then what would he become? You see, less than perfect, and the perfect God cannot change. Well, we've already seen that Jesus is God, and God, by definition, cannot change. So Jesus didn't cease to be God when he became a man, nor was he merely a divine person in a human body. So that's the first error we need to avoid when we're thinking about the incarnation. Now, secondly, we need to avoid this error, and this was actually an error that one of my professors in in the college I went to was teaching that Jesus didn't give up any of his attributes he still possessed them but he decided not to use them you know he decided that he wouldn't exercise particular attributes such as his omnipotence or his omniscience or his omnipresence actually when you stop and think about it to become a man he would have to give up the use of all of those attributes that are unique to God. In other words, he'd have to give up somehow the exercise of all of these things. Now what that means is this, that at least in his view, the all-powerful God chose not to be all-powerful, but he chose to be weak. That the all-knowing God laid aside all of his knowledge and he became ignorant. That the one who is everywhere at once limited himself to being one place at one time. Again, not giving these attributes up, but temporarily laying aside their use to exercise them again once his work was finished. But now, that can't be true either because th these attributes that God possesses are not things that he can either do or not do. They are things that are true of him. God is his attributes is one of the ways that theologians put this. They are a description of what he is, not of what he can do. I mean, consider, for instance, your own attributes, you know, the qualities that you and I have as, as human beings. Okay, you have intelligence, 
You have morality. At least you have the capacity to be moral. You have a will, among other things. Now, can you just simply turn those things off whenever you want? Can you become a non-intelligent being and sort of set aside the use of your intelligence? So maybe sometimes it seems like we can do that, but I'm talking about non-intelligence, okay? Can you become non-moral? Can you choose not to will? In other words, can you will not to will? <laughs> that doesn't, that's a contradiction as well. Well, the only way you can do that is by ceasing to be human because these things describe what human beings are. Well, the same thing is true with regard to God's attributes. These are what He is, you see. He can't be all-powerful and weak. He can't be all-knowing and ignorant. He can't be everywhere at once and limited to one place at one time. Because what that means is if you're weak, you're not all-powerful. If you're ignorant, you're not all-knowing. If you're in one place at one time, you are not omnip uh, omnipresent, but that is what He is. So if he ceased to have any of these qualities, <coughs> basically he would no longer be God. So Jesus emptied himself. What does that mean? Well, first of all, it doesn't mean <coughs> excuse me, that he stripped himself of any of his attributes, nor that somehow he gave up the use of these attributes. So what does it mean? It means that he stripped himself of his reputation. Notice that Paul says, the one who was God became man. And he didn't do it by giving up anything. Rather, he did it by taking something to himself. And that is a human nature. He's eternally God, but now he also becomes man. And having this new nature, as it were, I mean, he was in the form of God. Now he takes upon himself the form of a bondservant. That is, having the nature of God, he now takes upon himself the nature of man. In other words, the creator humbles himself to become one of his creatures, and he enters into this world. Now, you know, we really can't find an analogy that would adequately describe what it is that our Lord Jesus Christ did. There is a greater distance between God and man than there is between one creature and another. I mean, if we humbled ourselves to become one of the animal kingdom, let's say you became a dog, or you became an ant, or you became an amoeba, uh, the distance between you and these creatures is really quite limited, it's really finite, I mean, compared to the fact that God becomes one of his creatures, the infinite becomes something that is finite. This is the way that Jesus empties himself. He makes himself of no reputation by taking to himself another nature, that of a creature. But as Paul goes on to say, he went even further than this. In verse 8, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. It would be one thing if God were simply to become man. That would be an infinite stoop. But consider what it is that Jesus did. He not only became a man, even if he had become the richest man in the world, the greatest, most famous man in the world, even that would be an infinite stoop. But instead, he was born into very humble circumstances, the son of a carpenter. When he was born, as you know, he was born in a cattle stall, was laid in a manger, which is a feeding trough. Uh, that was his royal welcome into the world. Jesus grew up among sinful men. He was hated, and he was rejected, even by his own people. Uh, he was handed over to the Romans. He was put on trial. He was condemned. He was executed as a criminal. And let's not forget that in the particular kind of death in which he died, he was accounted by God and by God's people as one who was accursed. Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So basically, his emptying of himself refers to his humiliation. It doesn't refer to his giving up of his deity, but he emptied himself by becoming a man without ceasing to be 
God. I hope that part of it is, is clear. God can't change, uh, and yet God becomes a man. So we have one man, or one, excuse me, one person, who now possesses two natures. And that brings us to the second point. Jesus is fully God, and Jesus is fully man. One who possesses not one nature like we do, but two natures that are whole and complete, and yet, at the same time, separate. Now, everything that is true of God, then, is true of Jesus Christ. In His deity, He is infinite, He is eternal, and He is unchangeable. And everything that is true of man is true of Him. Uh, in His humanity, He has limited knowledge. He is limited to one place at one time, and at least while He was on earth. He was changeable. Now again, you know, throughout the, the history of the church, there's been various views that have been uh, proposed as to how we are to look at this relationship between the two natures. And let me just mention in passing uh, something we need to make sure we avoid. That these two natures are whole and complete and distinct and separate. In other words, Jesus doesn't, as it were, combine God and man into one new nature, into something that is new and different from either being God or man, again, because God can't change, and because He had to become one with us in order to save us, so He had to be holy and fully man. He couldn't be something other than man. There is no uh, communication of the attributes of one of His nature to the other nature. The reason I bring that up is because you probably remember that Luther believed that. And Lutherans today hold the idea that the human nature of Jesus Christ, His body and His blood, are ubiquitous. They are omnipresent. They are everywhere at once. Because they believe that when the Lord's Supper is celebrated that the body and blood of Christ are really present. And yet they're, they also are aware at the same time that it's being celebrated in several places at once. Well, how can he be in all these different places? Luther said, well, it's easy. The attribute, divine attribute of, of omnipresence is communicated to the human nature and it can be everywhere at once. Well, the problem with that is if, if the human nature becomes ubiquitous, if it's everywhere at once, then he's no longer human because humanity is not everywhere at once. And as John Calvin also said, if, if his flesh and blood is everywhere, then how come I don't see it? How can I move from point A to point B? Uh, this flesh and blood would be getting in my way. Well, it, it isn't because it isn't ubiquitous. Both natures are whole. Both natures are separate. And yet one person has them both. And that is the divine Logos, the Word of God. The second person of the Godhead, the Lord Jesus Christ. One person possesses two natures. But let me also just mention in passing that this also explains how Scripture sometimes will attribute one um, nature, as it were, at least what is true of one nature, to uh, a name that is given uh, that refers to the other nature, if I can put it that way. Now let me just give you this example because I don't know if you've ever run across this, but again, it is a great argument for the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ, Acts 20, 28. Paul says to the Ephesian elders, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Is there anything about that passage that sort of strikes you as unusual? It says here that God purchased the church with his own blood. And yet we know God doesn't have blood. Or does he? Well, God himself does it, not in his divinity, but there is one who is God who possesses a human nature that does have blood and that blood was shed for the church. Now it's been pointed out that whatever may be said to be true of either nature <clears throat> can certainly be ascribed to our Lord Jesus Christ. What's called the communication of attributes, that he possesses both sets of attributes. And actually, when we understand something more about the Incarnation, it also helps us to understand what the Bible says about Jesus Christ. 
Now here, here's one of the things that I think as Christians we often overlook. The fact that Jesus became fully man. And I think if we understand that, we can answer several of the objections, that, again, that Jehovah's Witnesses will bring up. They're the ones who attack the deity of Christ. And they point to the things that are true about his humanity, and they say, well, these things obviously can't be true of God, so Jesus can't be God. But you need to remember that he is man as well as God. He has a human nature, and those things can be true of his human nature, and yet he can still be God, as we've already seen. He must be, because the Bible says he is, and because God never changes. But what the Bible says is because Jesus is fully man, he also possesses all the limitations that men possess. While he was on earth, he was changeable. God is unchangeable in his divinity, his deity. He is unchangeable, but in his humanity, he is changeable. I mean, he was born of the Virgin Mary, wasn't he? Did he grow up? That represents some change, right? Did Jesus learn anything while he was here? Yes, Luke says in Luke 2.52, Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. That represents change. Jesus, while he was on earth, could grow weary and he could become hungry. John writes in John 4, verses 5 and 6, So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. And Matthew writes, of course, in, in the time that he fasted in Matthew 4, 2, after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. Jesus could get tired and he could get hungry, but God doesn't get tired or hungry. No, but Jesus does in his humanity. One thing we don't often think about and, and yet is likely true, it's very likely that Jesus also got sick. We don't read about it in scripture, there's no examples in scripture, but if he could die, certainly he could become sick. And we also read in scripture, Jesus as a man went through everything that you and I have gone through so that he could sympathize with us as our great high priest. Hebrews 5, verses 1 and 2. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided since he himself also is beset with weakness. This is one of the reasons why, another reason why Jesus became a man so that he could go through everything that, that we went through, so that he could sympathize with us. That's why when the Lord ordained a priest for, for his people, he didn't pick an angel, but he took a man, because the man would be aware of what it is the people he was interceding for were going through, and he could sympathize with them and pray as he needed to pray. Well, that's exactly what Jesus can do, because he's gone through everything that we could do. Jesus could die. We know that he died on the cross, Mark 15, 34 through 37. The ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they began saying, behold, he is calling for Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave him a drink saying, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. Now, we're, again, we're very familiar with these things. We, we read them all the time. And we know that Jesus had these limitations. We know he died on the cross. And yet, when we're confronted with a Jehovah's Witness, who they tend to, of course, point out the things that we're not as willing to admit could be true of the Lord Jesus Christ, somehow we buckle. Well, here's a couple of examples that I think will help us there. The fact that Jesus was, was fully man also tells us that, that Jesus did not have in his humanity unlimited knowledge. There were certain things that he did not know. 
uh, speaking about his coming judgment on Jerusalem in Matthew 24, verses 34 through 36, he says this, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Again, Jehovah's Witnesses love to point to this passage and say that Jesus could not be God because Jesus was ignorant of something, and we know that God is not ignorant of anything. But you need to remember that as a man, Jesus had the limitations of man, and this includes limited knowledge. Jesus, as a man, did not know everything. And even what he knew, he knew as a man. I think sometimes we... Well, I know that I have, and I'm, I'm sure that, that all of us are guilty of this, of, of looking at Jesus Christ as basically a man-shaped God walking through this world with unlimited knowledge, unlimited power, and, and everything else you would ascribe to God in his humanity. But that was not the case. Jesus had limitations. He had a limited understanding. At least, it wasn't unlimited. He didn't have the knowledge of God. Now, certainly... He knew things we wouldn't know because the Spirit of God communicated to him on occasion supernatural knowledge. Jonathan Edwards even pointed out something I thought was quite interesting where Jesus sometimes talks about the glory that he had with the Father before he came into the world. Well, Jesus remembered that. Well, how did he remember? Well, either the Spirit of God communicated it to him or he remembered it by way of memory like we have. Not the way God thinks of it, who knows everything all at once, immediately, comprehensively, but he remembered it as a man remembers something that he went through. Jesus was fully man. And remembering that Jesus also in becoming a man um, is fully man will also help us to understand the other area that Jehovah's Witnesses attack. And that is the statements that Jesus makes to the fact that the Father is greater than he is. John chapter 10, verses 27 through 29. Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. If he's greater than all, he's greater than Jesus. And so Jesus, in their estimation, must not be God. But again, remember, Jesus is also man. He says in John 14, verse 28, You have heard that I said to you, I go away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I go to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Well, how can Jesus be God when he clearly says the Father is greater than he is? If he were God, they would be equal. Well, don't forget what Paul just said. They are equal. He did not regard equality with God, a thing to be grasped. So in his divinity, they are equals. But Jesus here is speaking about his humanity. As a man, the Father who is divine is greater than Jesus. And remember in the covenant that God made in order to save us from our sins, Jesus willingly took the place of a servant and came into this world as a servant of his Father in order to lay down his life and in his role as a servant to reconcile us to God, the Father has the superior role. So he is, the Father is greater than Jesus in a couple of different senses from his humanity. Divinity is greater than humanity, but also in his role as the servant, the one who, who uh, humbles himself to serve his Father. His father has, a, as it were, a position that is higher. But the point, again, is Jesus is fully God. Jesus is fully man. He possesses both natures. They are whole and entire. They are intact, and they are separate from one another, and yet combined in one person. So remember that when you're talking to a Jehovah's Witness. Remember that Jesus is fully man and has those limitations. Now, one th last thing I want us to look at is because Jesus was willing to do this, he was willing to, to 
take this infinite stoop to reconcile us to God, to humble himself more than anyone has ever humbled himself. The Father also honored him above every other. Paul concludes our text, which is really verses 5 through 11. In verses 9 through 11, For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Well, again, Jehovah's Witnesses. Jesus was exalted to this place. How could, how could Jesus be God if he required exaltation? Well, again, this is not referring to the fact that as God he was exalted, but it's referring to his humanity. It's, it's the man Christ Jesus who has been exalted to the right hand of God. The one who has had this honor bestowed upon him, the, the, the honor where he says the name which is above every name, the Father has lifted the name of Jesus and bestowed honor upon it above every name that is named in the world. Can you think of one name in this world, any one person who has received more honor than our Lord Jesus Christ at the same time who has received more reproach than Jesus Christ, but that comes with the territory. But his name is the most famous that has ever been in this world. He has given to his Son as man all power and authority in heaven and on earth. Jesus in that authority commissioned his church to go out and preach the gospel. And the Father has given to Jesus the promise that one day every one of his enemies will bow the knee to him. Jesus humbled himself the most in order that he might be exalted the most. By the way, when I, when I was looking at this, I, I couldn't escape that one passage of Scripture that has always puzzled me, and that is in Matthew 11, verse 11, where Jesus is speaking about John the Baptist. He says, Truly I say to you, among those born of women there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now, I, you have to ask yourself a couple of questions. Is John the Baptist in the kingdom of heaven or not? Does that mean that I'm greater than John the Baptist because I'm in the kingdom of heaven or somehow he's still on the outside and needs to come in? Are we greater than he? Now, if that's true, that means that you are greater than John the Baptist. That means that you are greater than Moses. You are greater than Abraham, greater than Joseph. Elijah and Elisha and everybody else that you can find in the Old Testament because among those born of women, there was no one greater than John. And yet, you in the kingdom of heaven are greater than he is. That means you're greater than all of them. Well, I don't think that that's what Jesus meant by that, but that's kind of the conclusion if, if that's what you think it means. I think Jesus was pointing to himself. John is the greatest of those born of women. But the one who is least in the kingdom, of which John, I believe, is a part, I don't think he was standing outside the kingdom, who is Jesus, you see, is greater than he. Jesus is the one who became least in the kingdom of heaven by stooping lowest, as it were, and becoming the servant of all, didn't he? He's the one who was rich, but for your sakes became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. Jesus is the one who is the least in the kingdom of heaven and he is the one who is, because he became the least, exalted to the place of greatest honor and authority. He is the greatest and most exalted man who has ever lived. Now let me just say finally that once Jesus took our nature, once the incarnation took place, that's never going to be reversed. He's never going to lose his humanity. He will forever be a man, which is the problem with this idea that he strips himself of deity, becomes a man, and then throws his body away and becomes God again. No, he has to forever remain God and man because his humanity is our only link to God. His humanity is the only basis or grounds for our redemption. If he ceases to be man then our salvation at the same time ceases to exist because we are in 
Christ, that is the basis of our salvation in Christ, the anointed one, is the God-man. That's not going to happen. He remains God and man forever. When we see Jesus Christ represented after his ascension, how do we see him? We see him as a man. As a matter of fact, if you read through Scripture, that's all you see him as. That's almost the way it is that, that he represents himself now is through this instrument, through this humanity. I want you to note, too, that it's in his humanity that he's also going to return to this world. As the disciples watched Jesus ascend, two men stood by them in white clothing, and they said this in Acts 1, verses 10 through 11, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Jesus, you see, is the one who went up. Jesus is the one who is also going to return. He's also going to come down. Jesus is talking about his humanity, the one who is God in human flesh. So he is the one who's going to return. And as we see in representations even of the eternal state, he is still the God-man, the Redeemer, who keeps us forever in the grace of God. Now in closing, let me just make three brief applications. I know the subject of the Incarnation is broad. We've only just touched on it, but um, it's enough for one evening. But let's, let's consider a few things. First of all, consider that the Incarnation is the only way that you could be saved. It's the only way that, that God could redeem you. Uh, you are a sinner. I'm a sinner. And we needed a Savior. And the Savior, the only Savior that could possibly save us, had to be two things. He had to be God in order to have enough value. And he had to be man in order to pay your debt because you are man. He is the only way that you can approach God, the only way that anyone can approach God, only through faith in his name. The incarnation means that you must trust Jesus if you are to be saved because he is the only way. Now secondly, let me just mention that he was willing to do this in order to save you. Uh, think about what Jesus went through from, just from what we've just seen. I mean, what was his condition like as God? Well, we can hardly even imagine, right? Uh, he talks about the glory that he had with the Father before he came into the world. There, there's glory there. There is perfect love there. There is perfect blessedness there. God is perfect. He's exactly the way he wants to be. And yet, this one who enjoyed these things, again, as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 8 9, that he enjoyed these riches, was willing to become poor in order that you might become rich. In other words, he was willing to humble himself to become a creature. We, again, we can't even imagine what that would be like. The, the distance between the two. How would you like to, as it were, take your personality and put it into some kind of an amoeba? I mean, that doesn't sound too intriguing or too desirable, does it? But the distance that Jesus stooped was infinitely more than that. And he actually became one of his creatures. He actually became a man. And he entered into a world that hated him and he was willing to become cursed and and to die in order to bring you to God because he loved you so consider the love that is behind the incarnation that the father would be willing to give his son God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son but that the son would be willing to make this stoop and go through what he went through in order to save you and then finally, consider what this calls you to do in return, to follow his example. Isn't that what Paul is talking about where he opens up this section in verse 5? Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. We look at the fact that Jesus is our example in, in everything, isn't he? I mean, he's, he's the perfect living example of one who was fully devoted to his Father, fully seeking after him in his glory, fully committed to doing his will, obeyed him in everything. That is the example that we are to follow, but you see this example is also what we are to follow in Jesus. Have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus. Well, what is this attitude? 
Being God, he humbled himself and became a servant, took the form of a bondservant. And in that uh, humanity, humbled himself even to the point of death. Now this is an example that you and I are to follow. If, if you love Jesus, you are humbly to serve him, to humble yourself to become a servant by serving others in the way Jesus did. Uh, Jesus, being rich, became poor so that through his poverty he might make many rich, that he might make you rich. We are to do the same thing in a way that's consistent with our position, which is to humble ourselves and become servants, to take the gospel out to those who don't know him in order that they might be recovered from their poverty and might receive the riches that Jesus Christ has come to give. You see, that's how the kingdom of heaven advances, is by sharing this message of what Jesus did to make others rich to others, that they also might become rich and begin to serve him, that they too might help others become rich. That's the way the kingdom of heaven moves forward, and that's the way that Jesus is honored and glorified. That is the example, Paul says, that we are all to follow. So as we think about the incarnation, again, let's remember what it is that Jesus was willing to do for us as we come to the table. Actually, this is you know, a, a good introduction to the table, isn't it? Uh, a reminder of what Jesus Christ has done for us in order that we might follow his example and do the same in serving him. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer. And let's ask the Lord to help us, uh, to help us do that, to apply that, to own that, and ask that he might help us uh, follow that example.